Okay, so today's shear is uh, sponsored by Mrs. Yehudit Herman in honor of her mother's uh, yurt site, Chaya Harriet Bat Leib of Sophie. May the shear and the words of Torah that we say here will be Le'ilu Neshama. So tomorrow is the fast of Shiva or Betamuz, uh, which is the beginning of the three weeks. And I want to discuss uh, trying to understand a little bit what exactly happened on Shiva or Betamuz. What is so bad about the things that happen on Shiva Sarvetamas? And what should be our process, our avoda, practical steps, as we like to always say, something very practical to our life, how, what we could improve in order to, Amir Hashem, Bizocha, we've been davening for this, we've been feeling this since the beginning of Corona. Remember Pesach, remember the feeling before Pesach came, and we're like, Mashiach is coming. So that feeling carries us all the way through to the three weeks. And we know Betzei Simi Mitzrayim, Betzei Simi Yerushalayim, Pesach and, and, uh, and uh, Tisha B'Av, they go together. They're the same day of the year. So maybe we'll be zocha for that, all of that energy that Am Yisrael has felt in the last few weeks. We'll be zocha to see the rebuilding of Mashiach Tzidkenu by the time uh, Tisha B'Av comes. So I want, I want to discuss that a little bit. So what, are the, what exactly happened on Shiva Sarbet Tammuz? So the Gemara in uh, Tainus, tells us that five things, Tainus Chavav, the Gemara says, There are five things that happened to our forefathers on the 17th of Tammuz and five things that happened on Tisha B'av. Now, the Mishnah only highlights Shiva Sarbet Tammuz and Tisha B'av because they represent a unique time period. It's not just another fast day, but they come together. They're, it's actually the beginning of what we call Bein HaMeitzarim, Kol Rotfei HaYisigua Bein HaMeitzarim, all who chased us were able to get us between the Meitzarim in the times of confinement, which is between Shivas or Betamuz and Tisha B'Av. And the, and the Yerushalmi says, which is the Haftorah in, in, uh, of Divrei Yirmiyo, one of the three Haftoros of the three weeks, Makel Shaked I see a tree of, of uh, almonds, of, of the nuts, and because a shaked blossoms for 21 days, that's also the 21 days of, of between Shivas or Betamas and Tisha B'av. So we see that there's a special category that we're entering. And I want to focus on that category because what happens? According to, to us, the Ashkenazim, we start adding levels of uh, mourning. They start on Shivas or Betamas. We, we don't listen to music, to live music. We don't get haircuts. We, there's no weddings. According to the Ashkenazim, we, ta- we start already by the Shabbat Sabbatamas. And then comes Rosh Chodesh Av, the nine days. And then it gets even more severe and intense the morning on uh, Shavua Shechabo, the week of uh, Tisha B'av. And then we have Erev Tisha B'av. And then we have Tisha B'av itself that we're actually sitting on the floor. And then what happens? It's getting more and more intense. And then what happens? The next day? Is especially, it's going to be like that this year. Is, Tisha B'Av is going to be on Thursday. Friday is going to be Yud. We still have a little bit of mourning until Chatzos. And then it's Nachamu, Nachamu. Uh, it's Shabbos Nachamu. Like, what changes? We, we've been doing this for many years. But what changes? Like, we, we intensify our mourning, and then we have already Nachamu. Normally, in a normal mourning period, when somebody experiences a loss, it's, it's, it makes a little bit more sense. There's the severe mourning that starts on the day of sadness where we hear that somebody was nifter. And then it's the three days of crying. And then we have the whole Shiva. And then we have the Shloshim, the 30 days. And then we have the Yud Beis Chodesh, the 12 months. Here, it's, it's the exact opposite. What's going on over here? And then, we, and then we forget about it after. Like by, I understand weaning off of it, but we're getting more and more intense. And then we forget about it. What, what's Shavu? What, what's going on over here? So the Gemara says something very, very fascinating over here, that there's a difference between, between the Avelis of Tisha B'av and between the Avelis of, of mourning. You see, the Gemara in Brachos, Adaf Nun Ches, says that when there's, there's actually a blessing, there's a Gezeira She Mishtakeach Hameis Min that after 12 months, the family, we sort of like, we forget about the deceased. It doesn't mean that we forget about it. Obviously, we have yard site every single every single year. It means that we're not living with the hardship of carrying the burden and the yoke and the pain of the loss of somebody with us on a day-to-day basis like we, like somebody might carry around with him the first year of somebody being nifter. And in a way, it's a blessing. Otherwise, 
you know, we all know somebody who was nifter, and we are now walking around with all the pain of all the people that we know that were nifter. And therefore, there's a blessing after 12 months. But yet we find by Yaakov Avinu that when Yosef was taken away from him, he refused to get Nechama. He says, I'm not, I'm not being consoled. Why did he refuse to get Nechama? Because Yaakov Avinu felt there's no closure. I don't know that he was nifter yet. And unfortunately, here in Eretz Yisrael, there are cases of somebody who was missing in action, he was, he was kidnapped, right? The entire nation, we don't give up on somebody who was kidnapped. Even if we think he might have died, he may not have survived. We're going to pray for him. Maybe he'll come back. We don't know what happened. But we don't know. So if there's no closure, you don't actually forget about somebody. Because it's not over. He's still alive. And that's why Yaakov Avinu refused to get Nechama. And after 22 years of waiting, he's able to rejoice and to meet up with his son again. And that's why he refused to get Nechama. And there was no Gezerah, there was no decree that the mace will be Mishtakech because he wasn't actually dead. Same is true for us on Tisha See, when someone is Nifter, so then you feel the severe pain right away. And then you have to sort of let it go over time. You feel the pain because someone who is so a part of your life is no longer here. So we rip Kriya. We, we have a Levi. We cry. We sit on the floor. We have Shloshim. We have Yud Beis Chodesh. But for us, we need to build up to feel the pain in the morning over the loss of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. It's not something that we live with. It's not something that we knew in our lifetime. We need to try to understand what is it that we're missing. What's lacking in our life? What is it that we should be crying over? Maybe we should just be crying over the fact that we don't know what it is we should be crying over. So we build it up. We start with Shivas or Batama starting tomorrow, and we, we reduce. There's no music. We're not going to get haircuts. We're going to not have weddings. And then comes the nine days, and we're not going to eat meat. And we're, we become a little bit more strict. We're not going to drink wine. And then comes the Shavuot Shechalbo. And then comes Erev Tishavav and Tishavav itself, where we're actually mourning and doing the five Inuyim. And then we're finally, we've built up our understanding that we're mourning over the destruction of the Beis Amikdash, which is the clarity of what life is all about. We understand that we're missing something. Do you ever have the feeling where you're like, if only I knew what I'm supposed to do right now. You know that feeling? You ever have the feeling of like, if only I had clarity, what etza, what advice to give to my children or to my grandchildren? Or I, I want to move to Israel. Should I do it or should I not? I want to do this or do that. What should I be doing? If only I had a little bit of clarity. You ever have that feeling? So that clarity actually came when we had the Beis HaMikdash. A person could come into the Beis HaMikdash and connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, have that prophetic connection and understand the clarity of what life is all about and understand his role in being a partner to Hashem in making this world a better place and turning it into a better place. He would be the partner with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he would feel full of it. He would feel so invigorated. Yes, I'm doing what I was supposed to be doing and I know what I want to be doing and I know how to do it and I'm excited about it. That was the potential. That's what we're missing when we don't have the base of Mikdash. And that's why we build ourselves up to actually mourn over it. And this is what's amazing. The fact that we are able to mourn over the destruction of the base of Mikdash, what does that symbolize? What does that actually tell us? The fact that Yaakov Avinu was still mourning for his son after one year, after two years, after 10 years, after 20 years, and he's still mourning over Yosef, it means that Yosef is not dead. It means that Yosef is still alive. He's just not here with me. And maybe one day I'm married to see him, and then he was able to reunite with his lost son. The fact that we are mourning over the Beis HaMikdash means that the Beis HaMikdash is not dead. That the concept of that clarity, of that clear connection with the Kodesh Baruch Hu and with our purpose in life is not finished. It's just not here with us right now. So we are mourning over it. And by the fact that we were mourning over it, that is what gives us the right to celebrate Nachamu Nachamu Ami. Because the Gemara says, Kol al Anybody who mourns over Yerushalayim 
merits to see its nechama, its comfort. It doesn't say yizke ve'yire ve'nechamasa, that he will merit in the future to see the nechama of Yerushalayim. He merits to see it right now, just by the fact that we're willing to, after 2,000 years, we're mourning over the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Just that itself is comforting. Because that, just that itself means that we didn't give up hope on it, that it's not dead, that it may not be here with us, and that's why we're crying. But the fact that we're still crying means that the concept is still alive. It means that we're still yearning for it. You know, they quote the famous story of uh, Napoleon, who was, who was going around at night, and he sees, he hears crying from coming out of, uh, out of the shack, which was the shul, and he sees the lights are dim there, and people are crying. He comes in and he looks through the window. He sees everybody sitting on the floor. And he says, what's going on over here? They say, we're crying over the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Crying. A people that are able to cry over the past, are able to cry over their lost temple, those are going to be the people, says Napoleon, that are, will merit to see it in its future. We're saying not only will we merit to see it in the future, we're going to merit the fact that we're mourning over it. Well, we, that itself is the sign that we are seeing it right now. We're seeing the Nechama. And that's why we go straight into Nechama. And that's why it's the other way around from a regular, a regular time period of mourning where it's so sharp in the beginning and then we wean off of it. Here we build ourselves up to get to the level of actually understanding and crying over what it is that we're missing. And that itself gives us the Nechama. But now I want to focus on Shivas or Betamas, which starts off this entire process. What exactly happened on Shivas Arbitas? What are the five things that the Mishnah tells us that happened on Shivas Arbitas? So it says the Mishnah over there in Tainus Chavvav. Number one, Nishtabru Aluchos. The Luchos Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Harsinai and he breaks the Luchos. Number two, Butal Atamin, the carbon Tamid stopped. Number three, Hufkeir, they penetrated the walls of the city. Number four, Saraf Apostumus is a Torah. Apostumus burnt down the Sefer Torah. And number five, Humad Tzalem Ba'eichal. It was a Tzalem that was put in the Heichal. When I learned these five things, it always bothered me. I don't understand what's so... I understand these are terrible things. But like, let's take a look. Nishtabru Aluchos, number one. Moshe Rabbeinu breaks down the Luchos. You know what was the real sin that happened on the day that he broke down the Luchos? What was the day that Moshe Rabbeinu broke down the Luchos? When did he break the Luchos? Why did he break the Luchos? Because what were the Jewish people doing that day? They served the golden calf. They were dancing around the Egel Hazav. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai. He sees that they're rejoicing around the golden calf. So he took, he took the Luchos and he broke them. So why don't we say that on Shavas Arbatamuz, the Jewish people sinned at the sin of the golden calf? Why are you telling me just the result of it, which was that the Luchos broke? Never understood that. Number two, what do we say? Butel atomid. The carbon tumid stopped. I'll tell you a secret. All of the carbono stopped. What's the big deal that the carbon tumid stopped? Carbon tumid, that was the big deal? Why is that carbon more special than any other carbon? And then Huvka here, they penetrated the walls of the city. Okay, it's true. That was the beginning of, of the massacre of the people. But Huvka here is not the actual destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. It's the beginning of something. And Saraf Apostumus says a Torah. He burnt down the Sefer Torah. There's other Sifrei Torah. We still have Sifrei Torah today. Sifrei Torah have survived. What is so bad that he burnt down the Sefer Torah? And then they put a, a Tzalem in the Heichal. So they put a Tzalem in there. So you take the Tzalem out of the Heichal. Meaning, what's going on over here? I think there's, there's a common theme between all of these things, which will help us understand what, what is going on over here that we're starting this morning time period. The, the theme is that this is, it's a change in, in a relationship and it's, in, it's a change in, in the world as we know it. There's, there's a, a paradigm shift in the world that we had and what we lost. And that actually happens on Shivas or Betams. What does that mean? The first Luchos that we got, the Orachayim HaKadosh explains that it was Chakukala Luchos, it was a Kodesh Baruch who graved it into the Luchos. The Ksav was the Ksav that was given by a Kodesh Baruch. It was something that was, that was above, right? Every, it's the Aseris Dibros. Everything that we, ha, that we call, how do you say a thing in Hebrew? 
a thing, we call it davar. Davar comes from the word dibur. It's the dvar Hashem. We were able to see the sounds. So the first luchos built into them was the ability to understand Hashem's Torah and His secrets in, in an unprecedented type of way. It was the ability to see the luchos, to read what it says, and to just have total clarity in what is the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara says that Says the Gemara in Erev and Daf Nun Dalit. I'll quote it to you inside. My dechsev charus alaluchos. What does it mean charus alaluchos? You know we could do that. That's good. Okay, let's do. Okay, one second. Let's go to advance. Okay, no problem. So says says the Gemara in Erev and Daf Nun Dalit. What does it mean? Charos alaluchos. Charos comes from the word chirus, freedom, freedom. Il malei lo nishtabru luchot rishonot lo haita nishtakachat mi Israel leolam. Lo haita Torah nishtakachat mi Israel leolam. The Torah says, the, the Gemara says that if it, the first luchos were not broken, so then the Torah would never, never would have been forgotten from Am Yisrael. We would never forget any of the Torah lessons that we learned. It would be an integral part of who we are. Malach HaMavis would not be involved with us. We would be free. Le'olam. It would be real cheiris, real freedom. That's what the first luchos rishonos represented. The moment they broke, so it's true. It says the last Rashi al Yashakoach The fact that we're able to break something and nobody uh, sues us for it and no one claims you have to pay it back. The angels didn't say, oh, you broke something that's ours. Hashem didn't say to Moshe, you broke something that was mine. Nobody, none of the nations of the world said you broke something. It was a sign that the Torah is ours. So Rashi says, Yashakoch Shashibarta, Kodesh Baruch Hu told him it was good that you broke it. But on the other hand, it's broken. That reality of having clarity of Hashem is no longer going to be the same. That's the first thing, that it was Nishtabru Aluchos, meaning there was an opportunity to live the world with the utmost clarity, and it was taken away from us. The utmost freedom in this world, and it was taken away from us. And then the Gemara says that it was uh, Batala Tamid. Why Karban Tamid? Karban Tamid, from the time the Mishkan was built, in the second year that they left Mitzrayim, right? a year after they left Mitzrayim, they brought a Karban Tamid every single day. Every single day, consistently, for 300, close to 400 years of the Mishkan, Hello, do you see me? Yes, you still see me? One second, one second. What was that? I have no idea what's going on. Oh no. Okay, I'm not really sure what happened to our account, but I think I'm still on, right? Well, I'm second, one second, one second. Okay, is this still recording? Yeah, it is still recording. Okay, I don't understand what, what's going on. I have a few different things. Okay, I am good. Okay, so anyway, so we said Nishtabru Aluchos was number one, that the world as we knew it with the Luchos totally got. Number two is Batala Tamid. This is an important lesson in Judaism. You know, there was a famous uh, discussion in the base Medrash. What is the most important Pasuk in the Torah? If you're able to choose one verse, one Pasuk in the Torah that will sum up the entire Judaism, which verse would you choose? It's a famous Medrash. It's actually, it, it's a Medrash Pliya. There's, it's not known the source of this Medrash. 
uh, I, it appears in the Akdama of, I think, the Ben Yehoyada in his Pirushim. Um, and, and the Medrash over there discusses what's the most important Pasuk, right? Try to think for yourself. If you were to choose one Pasuk that summarizes all of Judaism, that is the, the crux the, of what Judaism is all about. So they came up with different opinions. One, one Tana said, oh, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lokein, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, Hashem Lokein, we have Emunah and one God. Another Tana said, that's only been Adam Lamako. The Haftal Recha Kamocha, Zeklal Gadol Torah, says Rabbi Akiva. That's the most important. If you're to put Judaism on a bumper sticker, it should be the Haftal Recha Kamocha. That's the most important Pasuk in the Torah. And then comes another town and says, I think it was Benazai, and he says, no, it's not this and it's not that. It's Esakeves Achat Taseh Baboker, Esakeves Ashenit Taseh Ben Arbaim. It's all about the carbon Tamid. That Pasuk from the carbon Tamid, a sheep in the morning and a sheep at night, that's the most important Pasuk in the entire Torah. And then they all ask, what's going on? Why? Why is that the most important Pasuk? And the, he explains over there. And you know, a lot of times we have, we have things that are very exciting in life. We have uh, Yom Kippur. It's a, it's a very important day. We have uh, Jewish holidays that are super important. But then really, the way a person makes a change in his life is not from doing something huge, giving a big donation, doing a big mitzvah. The real change in who we are comes from consistency, from doing something small, but every single day without stop. The moment the carbon tumid stopped, it can no longer be consistent. When you're doing something consecutively for 30 days, if you stopped one day in the middle, it is no longer 30 days in a row. The carbon tumid represents the core of what Judaism is all about, is doing something small every single day consistently, every day, maybe every single day of your life. You wake up and you dive in the morning and you learn. And you, at the end, you dive in at night and you learn every single day. That is a part of who my life is. That's what it means to be a Jew. Every single day I'm doing this mitzvah. It's consistent. The moment you stop doing it once, it's no longer consistent. So it's true. You can get back on track and be consistent from then on. And that's our, the power of tshuva and the power of redoing things. And it's a, being able to even undo our mistakes. But that's what the bitl of carbon tumid represents. It's different than any other carbon because it's the carbon that represents a continuity that goes from the beginning of the Mishkan all the way until the Churban Abbas. And that's what happened on Shivasar Betamuz, that it was taken away from us. And number three was Hufka Ir. The city was breached. The city, which was built already by David and Shlomo Amelech, the city that has the walls all around it, the city that represents... Yerushalayim, Oro Shalom, Yerushalayim, which is the city, the light, Yerushalayim Shalmala, Yerushalayim Shalmata. It's the place of connection, the place of understanding what life is all about. That's what you felt in Yerushalayim. The moment it's breached, Yerushalayim turned from Rishus Hayachid to Rishus Harabi. Yerushalayim turned from a private Jewish domain, our home, our nation's capital, our sacred location where we feel our family is able to unite. Yes, we welcome other people into our family. We welcome guests into our home. Yerushalayim welcomed other people from other nations. But the moment Yerushalayim was breached, so then our house is breached, our home is breached, our family was breached. It's not just that now the killing started inside the city. People were starving inside the city. It represents that now everything has been broken. We lost our core of who we are. And by the way, this has very much to do with what's going on around in the world today. The real threats, the real threats to any society, to any nation, is not external threats. I just had a program that we launched on Sunday, and we had a, a head in the Shabak was talking to our group, spent 30 years in, the, in Israel's secret service in the Shabak, and he was Israel's representative in Washington, D.C. for three years. And he said, I speak to a lot of uh, intelligent units. And I'm, I'm the one who was the representative to speak to the FBI, to the CIA. And, and I know about all the, you know, threats for the Jewish people, Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas. And I tell them, we have responses for all of those threats. We're always thinking of answers. 
we're even going to come up with, we know how to deal with corona, and we're going to come up with, with responses for that as well. He said, the biggest threat, and he said, you see this in America right now. America, people are talking about China, about Iran. The real threat is when the people on the inside start ruining it from the inside. The destruction will come from within. When people don't respect one another, when people don't respect the history of what this place represents and the values that it represents, so then they start fighting against one another, they destroy one another, and that's when outside threats could come in. The same thing happened to the Jewish people in the Churban Abayis. People did not respect one another. They had enough food and enough everything to survive for many, many years. The Babylonians would have left. But says the Gemara that they started battling with one another. They started fighting with one another. They started destroying one another. The Gemara is referencing that to the time of the Romans of the Bayashani, but at the end of the day, the concept of the same concept that they were totally destroying one another. And that's why all of the Kalalos really appeared. It's the same as so. They fought within one another and therefore it got destroyed. And that's what it means that the city was destroyed. It's no longer our private sanctuary, our private home. We fought inside our house. We weren't able to live as brothers inside our own home. And therefore our home became shattered and broken and life as we know it changed. That's what it means that the city was broken. And for the first time, Sarfa Postumus is a Torah. It doesn't mean that there is a Torah that was burnt and we don't have another one. Of course we have another one. This is the first time in world history that a Sefer Torah is burnt. It's true, they say it was the Sefer Torah, it was the Sefer Torah that was written already by Moshe Rabbeinu, and therefore it was, it was a serious uh, Sefer Torah. But at the end of the day, a Sefer Torah was, born, was burnt, was burnt down to the ground. And since the Sefer Torah is burnt down to the ground, and it's the first time that a Sefer Torah is actually burnt and defiled, that is a korban. It shows, it showed people something that they thought could never happen. A Sefer Torah is going to be burnt. A Sefer Torah can't get burnt. But it, it changed the reality. And humad selam beheichel, the heichel is the makum of Kedusha, the makum of Kodesh HaKadoshim, that a person who walks in there will be nifter, and now there's a vodazara inside there. A guy could come in there and put a vodazara inside the heichel of Kedusha. It undoes the whole concept of Kedusha as we know it. And therefore, we don't know Kedusha that way anymore. Each one of the five things that happened on Shavas or Betamus changed the spiritual world that we were able to interact with. It changed it from one side of the spectrum to the other. Right? What happened in the, in the years of enlightenment are years of darkness. What happened in the time of the, of the Yavanim, which are the, right? It, it caused darkness. These are all steps in darkening our spiritual connection with the Kaddish Baruch, with our mission, with our purpose in life, which is what the Beis HaMikdash represents. And it's step after step. We lost the first Luchos, and then the consistency that brought us all the way back to Maimed Har Sinai, to the Mishkan, that Moshe Rabbeinu built every single day. Imagine somebody telling his son, every single day, since Arna Kohen brought the first carbon. in fact, since Moshe Rabbeinu in the Yemei HaMiluin, before the Mishkan was inaugurated, started bringing the Korbanos, every single day we brought a carbon. It, it, it tracks back a, a, a consistency all the way back to Maimon Harasina. It's now lost. The city which housed Am Yisrael since David Amach was now gone. 400 years like that, it's gone. Right? So it, cha- it represents a, a shift. The, the Sefer Torah was burnt. The, the Tzalm was in the Echo, was totally defiled and taken away from us. This is what happened during Shabbat Sarbat Tammuz. And these are the days in which we begin the mourning period. It's a mourning period of losing our connection. And the reason why we have this Shivas or Betamuz is it's the beginning of understanding what is it that we're missing on a spiritual level? What is it that we're missing? On a spiritual level, what are we missing? What's, what's uh, taken away from us? Shivas or Betamuz starts to lay down the groundwork of try to understand Take a day of fasting, of mourning, of not eating, of not being involved in the physical world as much. Try to understand what are you lacking in your life? What's missing? What would make our world better? How could we make the world a better place and add those values and add that real connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? And Muna in HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't just mean that I believe there's a God. 
It means that I believe, right? Because how do we say, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Hashem Etzusicha Meret Mitzrayim. Why do I need that second part? Because it's Anochi Hashem Elokecha, believe that there is Hashem, that I took you out of Mitzrayim. Why? Why did you take us out of Mitzrayim? For what reason? What are we here for? There's a purpose. We're here to try to make this world a better place. We're partners with Hashem. We need to take responsibility for the world, for our families, for ourselves first, for our family second, for our community third, for our city, for Am Yisrael, for the world. We need to take responsibility for it and see how can we restore all of those things? How can we try to put a focus on what's missing in our life? And how can we, what actions can I be taking right now to try to make it better? to try to add more of a conversation around Torah, around values, around Hashem. That's really our job. That's why we have a day of mourning to stop and to think and then to start beginning and internalizing the process of, I can't believe that we're missing all this. And then to be willing to maybe even reach the level of, of crying over it, or like we said, crying over the fact that we don't even know what it is we're missing. I've been trying for three weeks to try to understand what is it that I'm missing. I don't even know. So I'm willing to cry over that. That's what Shivasa Vitamas is all about. That's what Tamara is all about. That's what our Avoda is all about. Next week, or maybe as we get closer to Tisha B'Av, I would like to take the time to speak about what we could do to undo it. What is it? practical steps? I said we're going to speak some practical steps in this shear, but I'm going to save it for another shear of real practical steps, which I think Chachamim the Chazal actually instructed us in the fact that they gave us the three uh, Gimel de Poranusa, the three Haftoros over the three weeks that we're going to start the first one in this Shabbos and then the next one and the following one after that. I think it's three steps of what it is we could do to restore our relationship with one another and to restore our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But I'm going to leave that as, as uh, food for thought for the next year because I think we covered a lot in this year, is it trying to understand, number one, trying to understand the mourning period and then turning it into Nechama right at the end, and also trying to understand what are the five things that happened on Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz, how they changed the world as we have it today, and they start giving us the, the understanding that we didn't just lose a building, we didn't just lose the city, we didn't just lose many people, we lost a deeper relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with ourselves, with each other, with our destiny, with our mission. And that's really what we're crying over. And that's what we need to start building those emotions over the next two, two three weeks so that we could be, the base of English is not built yet, that we can mourn over it, or that we build it up so much in ourselves that that itself will facilitate the rebuilding of the base of English. May we be zochet to see him here, We're going to now uh, hear a few short